Okay, so longtime followers of the channel will probably be quite confused by the fact that I'm covering Sonic Frontiers today. I've admitted multiple times to never really having gotten into this series. To me, Sonic has always come across like how pro wrestling must come across to non-wrestling fans, a strange subculture that inspires the most diehard loyalty for reasons that nobody seems to be able to fully understand. And much like wrestling, it's the type of thing that if you didn't get into it at an early age or don't have a predisposition for liking it, it's a bit of a tough sell. With that said, why am I covering it today? In the issue of fairness, I should mention for the record that this wasn't my idea. It's actually the idea of uh, these gentlemen over here. Wave. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, it's well known that these gentlemen here, if you know them, uh, don't actually like this game. So uh, this is likely a joke at my expense, isn't that right? I do. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, but also in the issue of fairness, we do have somebody here who actually is a fan of this game. Uh, over there. Guys, I'm still thinking about the Capcom! <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, this really wasn't my idea, but as they say, in for a penny, in for a pound. I will say though, even though this was essentially a compulsory playthrough, I still always enjoy hanging out with the guys. And you know what makes good times better? Good food. But as much as I enjoy cooking, who has time for that these days? But I don't have to worry about that now, and that's thanks to today's sponsor, Factor. Factor is a meal kit delivery service that delivers fresh, never-frozen, chef-prepared meals right to your door. With minimal prep, they're ready to eat in just two minutes. So if you're like me and don't have time to prepare good meals, skip the takeout this fall and pick Factor and choose from over 34 different meals and several different meal plans depending on what you're looking for. For example, if you're looking to bring out your inner Kratos, the Protein Plus package comes packed with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. But whether you're looking for something vegan, keto-friendly, calorie-friendly, or are just looking for some good old-fashioned fine dining, Factor has it all. And if you're not convinced, how about a little discount? Head over to Factor75.com or use the link below and use the code TACTICALBACON50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. That's Factor75.com, promo code, TACTICALBACON50, all capital letters. So what are you waiting for? Try it out today. My name is Don the Fawn Andrews, and I approve this message. Once again, thank you to Factor for sponsoring today's video. So I just want to say first of all that since I in no way have an encyclopedic knowledge of this series, I'm definitely going to get some things wrong. So you know, do with that what you will. This does mean that I can only judge the game based on what it does and what's on screen, and not for its insider references, its attempts to pander, and so on. So this is their chance to sell me on the series. So how did that work out? This is worse than an episode of Family Guy. <laughs> this is worse than an Arl Stein book! Well, here's the thing. I've played a lot of open world games in the past, both good and bad. I think my top six favorite sandbox games are in no particular order, Just Cause 2, Just Cause 3, GTA San Andreas, Red Faction Guerrilla, Breath of the Wild, and Infamous 2. Each of these games have their strengths and weaknesses, and they each try to do something entirely different. The quality varies somewhat, but they're all excellent games in my opinion. If nothing else, each of these games are, relative to their time, extremely polished and ambitious to varying degrees. The sad fact is, Sonic Frontiers relative to each and every single one of these games is probably the most slapdash sandbox I've ever played. This is like a severe downgrade. And I know the term isn't necessarily sandbox, but rather open zone, a distinction that is functionally meaningless except for the fact that one of them is Sonic and one of them is not. I mean, in fairness, it's not a traditional sandbox game in that you have multiple sandboxes that they have you play around in throughout the game, but that just means it's a sandbox in the retro Assassin's Creed mold. The usual comparison is to Breath of the Wild, and while that's a pretty damn good comparison and it's definitely what they were going for, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a perfect comparison, because Sonic Frontiers uses a Breath of the Wild style gameplay formula, but it also puts it into a linear progression. Plus, BOTW also had a story that was complemented by said progression, whereas Sonic Frontiers' story is, like the rest of it, kind of slapdash. The necessary plot is, Sonic and his merry band of mutants are flying around one day when they're mysteriously trapped in cyberspace, but because Sonic is the greatest man who ever lived, he breaks himself out of cyberspace and needs to rescue his friends. Meanwhile, there's this plot line about some ancient civilization that got wiped out by a mysterious force. We see this plot piecemeal throughout the game flashback style. Sound familiar? Well, it should. 
Now, am I one of those people who say that Sonic inherently can't tell a deep story? I don't know, I haven't seen enough of the series to really gauge whether or not it's just plainly absurd to have one, or if they can make it work. But I do know one thing, something doesn't need to be deep or dark to be good. I feel like the best tone in something like this series would be akin to your average action movie. Mission Impossible isn't dark or deep, but it's fun and well told. Or how about Ninja Turtles? I saw that movie Mutant Mayhem and I thought it was really good. It had a sense of humor about itself, but it also didn't shy away from the more serious themes while managing to mesh them and make it all work. I could tell I wasn't the target audience because there were some jokes I audibly groaned at, but it was fun enough that I could acknowledge that the movie is basically good even if some parts didn't work for me. I think Sonic is on the same wavelength as Ninja Turtles, where just because there is some inherent absurdity to the concept, that doesn't mean you can't tell good stories, so long as you're creative about it and don't go too far. I appreciate Sonic Frontiers and that it tries, but not nearly hard enough. The script is genuinely groan-worthy a lot of the time. Some of the quote-unquote funny dialogue is akin to humor in a bottom-tier animated children's movie. I've seen my fair share of pinball machines. I know one when I see one. Were those really part of the original ruins? I mean, the tech here outpaces Eggman's and is older than old. I guess the love of pinball predates civilization. And on a side note, I gotta say, the voice acting in this game sounds really weird. I can kind of see what they're going for here, I think they're trying to tone down the over-the-top aspects of the voice acting from the previous games in order to make the voice acting sound more natural and matter-of-fact, but as a result it makes everyone sound really weird, like they're old and have been chain-smoking all their lives. So, that was a thing. But then you have even worse dramatic elements where they try to have these big dramatic moments but they don't give it the necessary screen time in order to set them up and make them feel properly big. Like there's this one moment where Larry, Moe, and Curly use their combined power to cleanse Sonic of his cyber corruption which was just completely out of nowhere. So I couldn't help but laugh at how terribly it was presented. Or how about just about everything about Eggman and his quote-unquote character arc? It feels like they're forcing in dramatic elements while skipping over multiple pages at a time, making it all come across as so forced. And it's presented poorly too, because a lot of the time he's just sitting there and verbally explaining his character arc to Sage. In fact, I realized by the end of the game, he had no actual purpose to the plot other than creating Sage, but even Sage is dubiously consequential to the plot at best. Like, if the unknowable force that we fight at the end of the game was the true cause of all of this cyberspace shenanigans and these two weren't even in the game, I don't think anything would actually change, so long as you adjust a few details accordingly. Speaking of forced, Sonic Frontiers attempts to be dark in the most token and toothless ways possible, and it comes across as really obligatory. Okay, so, what the f*** are we watching? Well, if you were watching the cutscene, you would know. Like, you see these flashbacks where you see these creatures that you have no context for and know nothing about bite it. But any emotional impact is completely lost because I have no context for who these things are or why I should care. Compare that to the Breath of the Wild flashbacks where they go a ways to establish Link's relationship with the fallen heroes, giving us a connection to the flashbacks and therefore a personal stake in the matter. Surely there was a better way to do this than trying to emulate the Breath of the Wild flashback scenes and completely botching it. Which is funny because it's basically the same plot. There's this great unknowable evil that's rising, and so these people use these four different powerful robot type things to try and fight back, but then those things get possessed by the big bad, resulting in the death of an entire civilization. You know, I don't mean to be harsh in my accusations, but something tells me that Sonic Frontiers has penis envy when it comes to Breath of the Wild. But at least these cutscenes are better than the character cutscenes because 80 to 90% of the cutscenes in this game are just Sonic interacting with one of his companions that he's trying to free from cyberspace, or Eggman interacting with his cyber child Sage, who appears in several cutscenes but I still could not tell you a single personality trait of. Invariably, these cutscenes are just a couple of people standing around a mostly empty field or inside cyberspace talking to each other in a completely flat and uninteresting way, and also occasionally indulging themselves with really hilariously contrived flashback screenshots. Like, when they showed a flashback to Sonic 3 and Knuckles, my incredulousness could have melted steel beams. It felt so forced, and I feel like these flashback screenshots are essentially trying to jangle the metaphorical keys in front of your face to try and distract you from the fact that there's really 
literally nothing to the story. So when you stop and look at these cutscenes, for as many as there are, nothing is actually happening. It's like they tried to take a three hour story and try and stretch it into 10 hours. And I'm sure this is peak storytelling if you play a lot of Sonic and not much else, but to me, this game isn't peak anything, and that becomes apparent when you get down to the ground level of the gameplay. Okay, so here's the idea. You're thrown into an empty wilderness and your goals are twofold. Get enough memory tokens to activate cutscenes with your friends in order to make story progress, and the second part is a little bit more complicated. You need to collect these gear-looking pickups to open up traditional Sonic-style stages, and by doing these, you collect keys. And you use those keys to get the Chaos Emeralds. Those are the necessary objectives to complete a level, but there are some secondary objectives. First of all, you can play minigames to earn upgrade tokens and reveal more of the map, and you can also find Coco sprinkled around pretty much everywhere. You know, this game's version of Koroks, and you collect those to upgrade either your speed or ring capacity. So, I'm not gonna lie, this is actually a pretty good setup. The problem is... well, everything. Right down to the basic movements and controls, this game just feels very janky. The way Sonic moves feels very artificial. Even with deceleration turned all the way down, I found the way you speed up and slow down on a dime feels very stiff and inorganic, like you're just 0 to 100, then back to 0 in a second, with so many lurching changes in speed and no real transitionary physics in between states, it just feels inorganic. Plus, the way the game is programmed makes the way Sonic interacts with geometry feel very strange, like he occupies a completely different plane of existence, meaning there was a lot of weird collision and environmental interaction, and the aspects of the game that aren't awkward are automated, like the grind rails for example. You jump on the rail and are at a fairly consistent speed that has no relation to the speed that you were going when you jumped on it. And even when the game is ostensibly doing what it's supposed to do, there's often a sense of, was that supposed to happen? Where you fly off in a direction and you're not sure if there was a glitch, or if you were supposed to interact with something that looked completely separate to what you ended up interacting with. Is that supposed to happen, or did the game just glitch out? Because boy, does it glitch out. And the funny thing is, even the scripted sequences mess up every now and again. Sometimes I'll transition from rail to rail and then fly off in a completely different direction. How do you screw this up? What? <laughs> what the f I'm not looking for flaws here. This stuff just happened, and I'm just recounting my experiences. This is all made even worse in the actual classic style stages themselves. At least you can change the settings in the overworld to mitigate the awkwardness to some extent, but in the levels, they use a one-size-fits-all movement engine that's as smooth and painless as a sandpaper handjob. Surprisingly, this actually controls better than the actual levels where the controls are what matter. Yeah, because for some reason, uh, Kishimoto was like, oh, hey, we're gonna uh, make sure that the controls in the open world and the cyberspace shit control completely different. Everything about this feels wrong. The lurchy physics engine, the way you fly around at either mock speed or normal speed with very little transition between, the way that the terrain basically has no bearing over how fast you're going, the way the jumping physics feels so disconnected from your movement speed, the oversensitive turning controls, the inconsistency about whether or not the movement is tied to the design of the level or the position of the camera. It's a good thing that outside of a few instances where the requirements to get keys are surprisingly hard, these levels are quick and easy to 100%, because these are honestly and unfortunately a pretty undisputedly awful part of the game. Sadly, I think the movement controls are if not hindered, at least not helped by uninspired world design. The great thing about Breath of the Wild was that it had really tight mechanics that were complemented by the world's design. Outside of a few rare instances, the islands in this game feels like they purely exist as a means to put something between point A and point B. So as far as the actual terrain, it's nothing but filler, and the space it's filling is in no way thrilling because it feels so stiff and unnatural to control, giving you a double whammy of meh. A mountain, for example, being in front of you in Breath of the Wild was relevant to how you progress in the environment, whereas the world is almost incidental to the mechanics of Sonic Frontiers. Or let's give the Breath of the Wild comparison a rest and bring something else up. There's this game called Defunct, which I bought for 35 cents. It's like three hours, and it's nothing more than a pure mechanical exercise, but the mechanics it does showcase are really fun. You see, it's a momentum-based physics platformer where you have the ability to increase or decrease gravity temporarily, so the entire game is essentially about using strategic alteration of gravity to launch yourself around in order to complete challenges and find collectibles. That's a case where the mechanics and the world's design are intertwined from the ground up, so you can't have one work without the other. 
Whereas in Sonic Frontiers, the world is not designed for the mechanics, nor are the mechanics designed for the world. It's to the point that they have to keep contrivedly sticking Sonic gameplay objects around the world in order to give you anything to do that ties into the mechanics. And aside from these islands not complementing the mechanics, the islands also keep getting worse over time. The first island is easily the best. It has the most climbable architecture, the most interesting design, and thematically is somewhat standard, but at least is visually appealing. But then from the second island, you lose the visual appeal, and much of the architecture I like stops showing up. And the third island, well, that's where it starts to get really obnoxious, because it looks ugly, there's a lot of terrain you can't navigate, most of which is right in the middle of the level, forcing you to take the scenic route, and it starts to become unintuitive to even know how to navigate this island, given that they keep shoving you into forced 2D sections when you just want to use a boost pad, which is obnoxious on a mechanical level, as well as a philosophical level, because I can't help but feel like we've lost the plot if we're railroading the player in what is ostensibly a sandbox game. These islands take two and a half to three hours to beat, which feels like forever when you're already not into the game. But Island 4 feels like a joke. Several towers rise up from the ground and you have to climb on them to complete the level. The whole thing is over in less than an hour, but at least it's a pure mechanical exercise and it was over quick, so it's probably my favorite island in the game. I didn't even bother with the last level. I was so done by that point, then I was locked into a combat scenario where I had to parry over and over and then decided, nope, and ran straight to the fishing spot and decided to buy my way through the level. Yeah, the funny thing is, you don't even need to play most, if not any, of the content. If you collect enough of these purple coins, you can actually spend some time fishing and buy your way through an entire island. I don't think I've ever seen this before. A system where you can actively play a completely nothing minigame in place of actually going through the game. But hey, I'm not complaining. But two things. One, isn't it funny how big the cat has essentially taken on a second life due to this self-aware knowledge that he's the worst character in the series, so they're just kind of playing along with it? And two, this is why I called Sonic and his friends mutants, because you literally have realistic fish you're fishing for in this minigame, so what the hell is Sonic supposed to be? But yeah, even though this is practically the most baby-level difficulty minigame I've ever seen in my life, it's preferable to playing the game by the end. This is peak, 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 hype, hype, hype. So I've been playing this game for a little while now, and uh, I don't like it. But wait, I hear you say. There's more to this game than just platforming and environmental traversal. Granted, that is true. There's also combat, which is unfortunate. This is one of the most embarrassing excuses for a combat engine I've ever seen. When you start out, your basic attacks are either a series of punches or a homing strike, both of which are done by using the same button, so basically this is a one-button combat engine, which wouldn't necessarily be a big deal if this game didn't have such a heavy combat element. It's so basic as to be completely mindless, and the presentation is so mediocre that laying into all these enemies has the weight and impact of tossing a wet bag of laundry on the floor. The way I see it, combat engines like this have two pillars that make up good quality. Intricacy and presentation. Are these not the worst combat mechanics of all time? It's just you click buttons. You generally need some degree of both, but many combat engines have prioritized having intricate combos to pull off, while many others have tried to be more simple while just looking and feeling good to pull off. The combat in Sonic Frontiers has very little of either of these. It's neither skillful nor cathartic, so it's basically just white noise. Even then, it's not done well. Some enemies might block your attacks, but in that case, you just need to do a psi loop and run around them, which only adds a single step between engaging an enemy and attacking. And if you do get hit and lose your rings, no worries, just psi loop in a circle a few times and you get more rings than you'll ever know what to do with. Meaning that you basically never have any real combat challenge because you have everything you need to stay completely unharmed at your fingertips at all times. So it's easy as hell. I'm, I'm just, pressing, just pressing a button. Oh my god! Plus, Sonic usually takes up so little of the screen I can barely tell what's going on in standard combat. Then there's the parry, which is one of the most unbalanced things in the universe. I love getting the parry in things like God of War because you have to hit the block button at just the right time, so it takes skill to pull off, making the momentary gameplay advantage you get from it feel earned. In Frontiers, to parry, you just hold the two shoulder buttons. You hold it and whatever is the next thing that hits you is automatically parried. Literally that's it. There's no time limit. There's no timing whatsoever. That is so laughably amateurish, to have this mechanic like this be so simple and half-baked. You even pause in the air when you're holding the buttons for a parry, making certain minigames so trivial. 
So already this combat engine is pretty dire, but then you get into the upgrades, which beats whatever tiny amount of difficulty was left in this game into the ground. The literal second optional upgrade you can get is this weird energy beam that you can shoot out of your feet, because apparently this is Dragon Ball Z now. You know how you do this attack? You jump and hold the left bumper. That's it. To do all this, you hold a button. This makes almost all the combat in the game so easy as to be trivial. Almost every combat encounter can be cheesed just by holding a single button. Who thought this was a good idea? Let me preface this next bit by saying that I stopped fighting the mini-bosses after a while because they became increasingly obnoxious and obtuse to fight as the game went on, seemingly adding more and more steps to damage them with every new one they introduced in the name of upping the ante, but when you're dealing with a combat engine this unsatisfactory, adding extra steps doesn't make the battle more stimulating, it just makes me exasperated in the sense of wondering when we're gonna get to the point. With the exception of Sumo, I thought that one was okay. With that said, the first time I fought the Azura mini-boss, I admit I was having some trouble. Granted, that was partially from the controls being unresponsive. I was pressing the button, and that thing was occurring! But as soon as I got this attack, all challenge previously there for that mini-boss went out the window, and when you go that far in breaking a combat engine that was already not very good to begin with, everything on top of that is just gravy. Like this one weird attack where you just throw a bunch of glowing balls at whatever enemy you're aimed at. You press two buttons and it triggers a non-interactive cutscene, so you don't need to charge it up, there is no condition for using this attack, you can use it anytime, and it's basically guaranteed damage. Even the main level bosses can be pretty insignificant with simple attacks like this. I mean, the Wyvern boss was only a bit difficult because it had so many limbs, so it's slightly hard to tell if it's telegraphing an attack. I've heard some people seem to like this boss, and fair enough, it's probably the better out of all of them in the game, but I still don't love it. However, the Giganto fight and the Knight fight, because of the infinite parry and the infinite kick beams, are basically chumps to beat, even with the limited amount of time you have for these fights. Of course, that is when the actual functional mechanics aren't completely ballsing up. I swear, the Giganto fight was where my apathy towards this game turned to dislike, because I was clipping through the boss, the camera was spazzing out, I was seemingly not even hitting the boss half the time. It was an absolute nightmare. <laughs> as irritating as the night fight could be, at the very least the boss didn't completely break, but the Giganto fight was absolutely atrocious. Although the music was pretty nice. It reminds me of Unleash the Archers, a really damn good band. I almost feel bad for it, because Sonic music is almost universally good, but much of it belongs to less than stellar games, and in cases like this, it almost exists separately to the actual game. Like I'm listening to music on my phone while playing the game, instead of the theme actually being a part of the game, if you see what I mean. It feels disconnected, which is why I was in favor of God of War Ragnarok winning the soundtrack award at the Game Awards. Do I think this game deserved to be nominated? Yeah, sure. Did it deserve to win? Well, no, because I think a game's soundtrack is more about just playing musical notes. It's about enhancing the emotion of the game through music. And I wouldn't say this enhances the emotion because it feels so separate to the game. Oh man, I got off track. I could go on for ages about all the different ways they completely screw the pooch in regards to the combat engine, but it's butchered in every way possible. Definitely the most haphazard thing about the game. It's funny, I've heard people compare this to Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, and I think if that's your attitude, you're delusional, quite frankly. Metal Gear Rising Revengeance has a combat engine that works extremely well. It's not the most complex, but there are complexities that do exist. However, more importantly, the presentation is absolutely peak. That game gets full points for catharsis, whereas the combat in Sonic Frontiers is not peak. It's minimum at best. And honestly, while we're on the topic, the presentation is also minimum in Sonic Frontiers all around, which is to say it's not very good. This is an embarrassingly ugly game, and I'm not just saying this because I'm playing it on the Switch, although to be fair, that's the version that most people have played. Any version of this game is lackluster in the presentation. The amount of pop-in in this game is frankly atrocious. I don't think I've ever seen more pop-in in a game without it being a moderately incompatible emulation. Literally, it's ceaseless. Every bit of level architecture pops in, including grass textures. 
The levels themselves and whatnot look fine from a distance, but once you get in, you start to notice there's a real lack of attention to detail. Like a lack of animation variety. I mean, look at him falling. Or when you're holding the back of this shark, you're not actually surfing in the sand, you're just clipping through the ground. All they would need to do is add a sand flying effect where his feet meet the sand and they'd be golden. Another example is how in every instance where Sonic is meant to be deflecting something, he's never actually making contact with the thing he's deflecting. Or how about this moment where he's swinging a giant sword? Notice anything wrong? Even once you get past that, the art design is just really messy because there's no cohesion. This literally feels like someone just took a couple of maps and decided to plonk various bits of Sonic architecture into it without realizing how out of place it would look. Like, is there any reason why this place that is ostensibly supposed to be a real location has floating rails, bounce pads, weird balloon things, and so on? It looks so jarring, and it didn't need to be this way. Like, look at those giant towers you can climb. I actually think those fit perfectly well, because that looks like it could plausibly exist in this world, and also have all the little bits and bobs that it takes to get to the top. I feel like if they took that and spread it out to the entire game where everything had a consistent style that integrated Sonic-style gameplay elements into them in a more natural way, I'd be praising the hell out of the art design because that would take a lot of thought and a lot of clever work. Plus, they've proven that they were capable of it, and yet you still end up with a whole bunch of floating platforms and whatnot that look so jarringly out of place it's ridiculous. As if they were from a completely different game. The elements of Sonic-iness seem to be at odds with the actual game itself, and that's kind of a problem given the fact that being a Sonic game is kind of the whole point. None of these things are killers to the overall game, but the fact of the matter is, a real lack of attention to detail just shows how little they cared, or at least how little it appears they cared. And I feel like in a game that had better controls, better combat, better mechanics, and so on, I could overlook some of this stuff, but I find the small flaws become way more apparent if there are a lot of big flaws as well. Everything I've examined so far feels so slapdash, and I know I've already said that a couple of times, but it continues to be true. And yet I still feel as though I haven't even discussed what I feel is the real killer with this game. The mechanics are all well and good, but it's how you use them that can make or break a game. And make no mistake, the actual content in this game is certainly broken. Perhaps not literally, but figuratively. I would say much of the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is encapsulated by these many mini-challenges both of the platforming variety and of the minigame variety. The platforming ones are okay, I guess, outside of the 2D ones. Many of them feel far too automated, but at least they do take some level of skill, so I can at least tolerate rolling around the overworld and stumbling across these random segments. They go by quickly, sometimes so quickly I can't even tell what's going on, and they give you memory tokens. Perfectly okay. But the proper minigames to get the upgrade tokens and open the map? Oh god. Like, what's your favorite? Pressing all the buttons in a specific pattern? Jump rope where you can just hold the parry button and pause in the air? Ones where you hit a ball into a couple of rings? Or how about those ones where all you need to do is dodge left and right with the shoulder buttons? Oh, oh, how about the ones where you need to parry attacks? So you can just, you know, hold the two shoulder buttons and wait. This is on the level of those games and those toddler activity centers. The one activity in this game that I think has some merit is where you have to activate an hourglass and have to make it to a specific point on the map in a time limit. That actually takes some intuition and a bit of skill. The time limit is usually so generous that I don't think I ever failed one of these missions, but, I mean, they're okay. Now I know what you're gonna say, you don't necessarily need to play these because you can technically get through this game without upgrade tokens or having a viewable map. But then again, just because I can technically get through the game without accessing half the gameplay, that doesn't mean the gameplay is excusable. With that said, you can't skip all of it. There are story mandatory minigames. Multiple rounds of Coco Roundup, an Ikaruga minigame that comes clean out of nowhere, a Crane minigame that takes forever, and worst of all, Pinball. You have a tiny pinball table and have to get 5 million points to progress, which takes just shy of forever. This is by far the worst virtual pinball game I've ever played, and that includes NES Pinball or Duke Nukem Forever Pinball. But what's really funny is that they thought this Ikaruga minigame was so good, they decided to reuse it for the final boss. I wish I was kidding. I have no words. You know, the pinball minigame may be the worst minigame, but this is by far the worst part of the actual game. 
Who in their right mind thought a 20 minute fight with a style of gameplay completely unlike most of the rest of the game was a good idea? I don't even think I need to justify myself in this case. This being a baffling decision is pretty self-explanatory, especially making it so long and tedious. But let me just tell you, watching this can't possibly do justice to just how bad this boss is. You're given three lives and that's it. Then there's a point where you cease being able to damage the end for a scripted sequence. It took me half an hour to beat this boss. I went into this thinking I would place it pretty high in my list of worst bosses ever, but there's no qualifier. This is the worst final boss I've ever experienced. It is so bad. So bad, in fact, that they had to patch in a better ending, which I won't be playing because I don't want to encourage this attitude. But this whole thing is so funny to me. Like, there are patches that fix bugs and add extra content and so on, but they actually botched the ending so massively, they patched in a new ending. So yeah, basically, there's not really one thing about this game that I would consider to be good, at least by the end. But here's the shocking thing, for as much as I've railed against this game for the past god knows how long, I don't actually think it's without merit. I do think there is something to this game, and it has potential to be good. As a matter of fact, I was, if not enjoying myself, at least stimulated enough for the first hour or two before the repetition sets in and the jankiness starts to become really apparent. There is a base for a good game here, unlike, say, for example, Sonic Forces, which was 10 pounds of crap in a 5 pound bag. But Frontiers feels like the beta version, or maybe even an alpha version, of a game that would be pretty good as a finished product, if you see what I mean. Everything about Sonic Frontiers feels so unrefined, as if they were at a stage where all the basic mechanics and world design is functioning, but they skipped over the part where they tested out to iron out the flaws. So the engine is janky, there's a lot of visual presentation issues, and there's a lot of flaws with the gameplay that would have been ironed out. There's a lot of potential here, but you can't pay your bills with potential, and in that respect, this is pound for pound the most unfinished sandbox game I've ever played. Like, there are sandbox games I've played in the past that I don't like, like Just Cause 4, but Just Cause 4 is pretty much a finished, polished game for what it is, it's just executed extremely poorly. But comparatively, these two games are at completely different levels. And hey, I did have some expectations for this, because critics liked it and some of the fans described it as peak gaming, but to me it pretty much blows it in every respect. I mean, could you imagine if GTA 6 was released and it was on this level? We'd never hear the end of it. So naturally, seeing all the praise and then playing it made me feel like I'm living in the Twilight Zone. This is peak, huh? Peak, 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 high, high, high. Do I think people are wrong for liking this game? No, of course not. People can like what they like. But I think people should have higher standards because I do feel like this series is being held to a lower standard than the rest of the industry. And the thing is, I don't say any of this as a hater. Nobody was holding a gun to my head and telling me to think a certain way. But I do believe everything I've said, and I say this as somebody who refuses to give the series any more leeway than I would give anything else. I believe not all games are created equally, but I do believe a certain standard should be upheld, especially when it comes to AAA games. Alright, we're done here now. I'm gonna go shoot some pool. Come on, baby. <laughs> oh! Oh! Fuck yeah! If you like what I do here and want to support the channel, you can like this video, leave me a comment telling me what you think, subscribe, and hit the notification icon so you're always up to date on what I'm doing. And if you want to support the channel in a more direct fashion, you can pledge to my Patreon for unique perks and rewards such as early access, Discord benefits, and exclusive content along with these fine folks right here. And an extra special thank you to Billy Knot, Brooklyn, Ga004, Cotton Swab, Christopher Fulton, Layabout, My Name is Tank, Raph, Twisted Wishes, Ty Trovi, and Weird Webster for going above and beyond. Elsewise than that, I've been the King of Snark Style right here on Tactical Bacon Productions, and I will see you next time. Stay crispy, my friends. He actually drank it. He actually f***ing drank it. <laughs> Jesus Christ, are you okay? I'm fine. I'm still thinking about the cocoa. I'm still thinking about the cocoa! <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I think that's good. Best f***ing game in the world! 10 out of 10! 100 out of 100! F*** this sh
Oh, you agree? Oh! <laughs>